आज रात को आज सुबह मैं जल्दी उठ गया था पांच बजे गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन आई एम डॉक्टर वैशाली एंड ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ सेंटर ऑफ फार्मास्यूटिकल्स एक्सटेंड वॉर्म वेलकम टू आर मॉडरेटर एंड स्पीकर्स फॉर द टुडे सेशन आई ऑल्सो वेलकम द ऑडियंसेस हु आर विद अस टुडे फॉर दिस वेबिनार इट गिव्स मी ऑनर टू इंट्रोड्यूस आर डिस्टिंग्विश्ड मॉडरेटर फॉर आर टुडे सेशन डॉक्टर वेपायन मुखर्जी हु इज प्रोफेसर इन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ ई एन टी uh kolkata apc medical college uh, he has also con- uh, organized a, 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 a iso con 2019 and uh, he has many things for his credits uh, and uh, without any further delay i would be handing over the session to dr vepayan uh, sir over to you sir thank you good afternoon everybody and namaskar first of all i like to thank uh, central pharma for organizing this uh, webinar with three great speakers so they will speak with three different topics one by one first dr s p dube will speak on flexible endoscope in ent practice and he actually he needs no introduction but i will speak a little bit regarding dr s p dube he was the past national president of ay he is a former editor of indian journal of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery he is national mentor for cochlear implant surgery recently his surgical innovation published in national journal cochlear implant made easy by bhopal technique which make this surgery easy for young surgeons he is mentored cochlear implant surgery in 28 centers across the country in nine states including prestigious institute like bhu and five medical colleges in kolkata indore ujjain and udaipur out of 29 mentees in different part of india 21 mentees are doing independent cochlear implant surgery in nowadays he has done more than 1200 implant in last 5 years and recently he has performed 10 cochlear implant surgery in a day at amritsar on 550th part uh, day of sri guru nanak dev ji all these services were given complimentary and apart from surgeon he is a news editor a news reader and health anchor and done cameo roles in movies like arakshan satyagraha and toilet a love story so dr sp dubey please thank you very much uh, dr pan for such a illustrious and kind introduction and uh, Though the cochlear implant is very close to my heart, and I am doing a lot of cochlear implants nowadays, but today I am going to speak about flexible endoscopy in ENT practice, which I started when I have started my career. And what I feel during last these years that flexible endoscopy is an integral part, should be an integral part of a armamentarium of an ENT surgeon, because there are several things, several information which we can. Take out through the flexible endoscope is uh, really innumerable. There are so many things which we can do. Apart from uh, keeping patient in a physiological position when we do the rigid scopy, definitely we are going to alter the anatomy. So let's start with my presentation. Screen share, Kamal. So thank you very much, Centro uh, Centro Pharma, for giving this opportunity to meet friends as well as interact and share my experience with flexible endoscopy. Thank you, Dwaypan, and uh, two friends, great friends who are always there with me, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal from Indore and Dr. Deepak Kaldingpur from Bangalore. They are not friends, but they are my guide and philosopher also. So let's begin with the flexible endoscopy in ENT practice. As you know, I belong to Bhopal. Kolkata is a very good place nowadays. It is very much in shackles of uh, COVID. Cases are increasing here. Our Chief Minister Shivraj Singh Chauhan is already COVID positive and he is in the hospital. Anything starting with history, how the flexible endoscope uh, came into existence? Invention of electric light by Thomas Alva Edison. Everybody knows in 1879. After that, semi-flexible gastroscope was invented in 1932. Nowadays, you can see the gastroscope is very much in place, and a lot of ENT surgeons are also also doing uh, flexible gastroscopy. 
our pioneer, Dr. Jay Kumar Menon from Trivendram, he is running a course for a fellowship course for flexible gastroscopy, which can go through the nose. That is a transnasal gastroscope, which is 5.5 mm thickness. Invention of fiber optics in 1957 and first flexible endoscope was invented in 1961. Indications of flexible, flexible endoscopy in ENT practice are varied, like examination and dynamic evaluation of larynx, how a larynx works. And as I told you, that very important is the physiological position of the patient. In flexible, you're not pulling any tongue. You just go through the nose because we know the anatomy of the nose and can see the movement of the vocal cord, any lesion over the vocal cord, or if there are any vocal cord paralysis or any paradoxical movement of the vocal cord, which we can see in real time and really evaluate the condition. Spatial is very helpful in spasmodic dysphonia. Sometimes when you want to give injection of Botox, you can uh, give injection from outside by seeing the electromyography. And better than this, what we can do, we can put a flexible endoscope and through which now needles are there, which can go through the working channel and we can really put injection where we want. Difficult intubation, I have done so many difficult intubations for my dental surgeon when I was, I bought my flexible endoscope. When I was buying that endoscope, people were saying that being an ENT surgeon, you are buying this. I bought it in, I think after doing my MS in 1996, 2003. I bought my first flexible endoscope, which is a Pentex scope. So the economy and survival was very much in question, but I have done a lot of intubation for my dental surgeon, especially for TM joint and gyrosis, for my anesthetist, if any case for a spinal injury in which you cannot flex or extend the head, in which you simply railroad, and how I will do it, I will show you in the video. Sleep apnea workup, though the Muller's maneuver is not now, now we are doing more and more dice, which is also with the help of flexible endoscope. But Muller's maneuver was very popular in which we do the forced uh, reverse valve salva and we see which part is collapsing and by which we can predict that which, where we have to do surgical intervention. In patient of GERD and LPR, which is more and more coming to the ENT surgeon, what clinical finding we have, and this you can very well see with the flexible endoscope. And FES, it is not the functional endoscopic sinus surgery, but it is a functional endoscoping swallowing study. It is another FES which is not popular amongst ENT surgeons, but it should be popular and uh, the people who are taking their career as a laryngologist or as a swelling disorder specialist like Jai Kumar Menon and Nupur Narurkar or Sachin Gandhi, there are very few you can count on finger. There is a need for more and more surgeon who can do FES in which we can give the different consistency of the fluid to swallow and we see that what aspiration score is there. Like in a patient of hemiplegia, when we have to remove the RAS tube and what consistency of fluid which we have to give, we can very well predict with the help of functional endoscoping swallowing studies. Others, uh, which are very uh, small indication, but very useful indication, I have seen people have removed the tracheostomy tube and they, when they are reinserting the tracheostomy tube, sometimes they lost. And there is an emergency and there is a panic that tracheostomy tube is not going into the right place. It's very easy thing if you can railroad your tracheostomy tube onto your flexible endoscope and when you are reinserting it under vision, you can very well uh, reinsert the tracheostomy tube and avoid any such kind of emergency or panic situation. In laryngeal trauma, Sometimes it is very difficult to examine the larynx, but if you have a very thin laryngoscope, you can go through the nasal cavity, park your flexible endoscope at nasopharynx and see what is there, whether the uh, vocal cords are injured or some uh, thyroid cartilage is coming towards arytenoids or some arytenoid injuries are there. Sometimes because of the rough anesthesia also, sometimes arytenoid dislocation is there. All these things you can see very well with the flexible endoscope if your eyes already sees this condition regularly. Acute epiglottitis is a condition in which previously it was absolutely no-no to do the laryngoscopy, but now with the help of flexible endoscope, with thin flexible scope, you can very well go through the nasal road and see actually what is happening there before starting the treatment. Visualization of the foreign body before radioscope attempt. You can see now the people are with very telescopic foreign body uh, removal forceps by which you can 
catch hold the foreign body and remove it. But now, previously, what we used to do, we used to do with the, the pipe like uh, endoscope, in which very narrow and very tubular vision was there. And sometimes we struggle, and uh, foreign body removal is not in Kyoto. But if you put your flexible endoscope before it and see where is the foreign body is lying, then you attempt your rigid endoscopy. The results are absolutely okay. fantastic. Now, it is my standard practice that if I'm not using the telescopic forceps, I always use flexible endoscope to see the foreign body position first, then subsequently I go along with the rigid scope and the forceps. Confirmation of the placement of the tube, sometimes an anesthetist or the patient, if he's in the ICU and having tracheostomy tube, single lung ventilation is there or some problem is there, you can always go and find out where whether your tube has slipped into the one of the right bronchus or it is lying where it has to lie, that is about the carina. So confirming the placement of the tube even in anesthetic condition, if there is any doubt, you can always do it. All other patients, like in burn patient, in which contractures are there, in all these patients, flexible endoscopes is very helpful in intubating. This was the setup which I have long back, 15 years back. I have this kind of uh, Pentex endoscope along with TV monitor, light source, everything was detached. I bought this uh, pediatric flexible endoscope for uh, pediatric work. And believe me, there are so many conditions like laryngomalacia. In case of laryngomalacia, even in children who are only two days, three days, four days old, you can do and see if there is any tracheoesophageal fistula or other conditions are there. You can always help your pediatric study also. This is again a laryngoscope, which is I bought from the Starch company. It is very useful if you want to do some work, office work in uh, uh, like a small, very small vocal cord polyp. Uh, these scopes are less in length, so it is not very cumbersome to work along with this. And the forceps are very sturdy, which are provided by the starch. This is the Pentex scope, which was my first scope. It has got a very big length. It's a bronchoscope basically, and the diameter is 5.2 and the internal diameter or the working diameter is 2.2 by which you can take biopsies and sometimes it is very useful if you see the patient is in the ICU, it has got the one white lung, you can very well go through it and you can suck out all those things and it really gives a life-saving procedure because ventilation improves immediately. Whatever suction you do through the uh, your uh, tracheostomy tube, it will not help because sometimes if left lung is collapsed, or left lung is filled with secretion, then definitely you have to go through the scope because it has got very good maneuverability. You can always suck out those mucus plugs from the left, left lung or uh, pus filled in the left lung. This is the modern setup which I am using nowadays. It's the Olympus workstation. It is there in one of the multi-specialty hospital where I go for doing all my advanced work. It's a Olympus thing. It's a Olympus scope. Again, 5.8 diameter and in a diameter 1.2, it has got a very good feature, which is called as NBI or the narrow band imaging, which is uh, which has got very good indications. And narrow band imaging is very much helpful in picking up the early lesions of malignancy, how it looks like, how we can switch on to narrow band imaging. I will show you in the video. That is how we sterilize our. Uh, in COVID era, sterilization is very important. I just want to share you with that how you can sterilize this kind of tray we have in which it is covered with the endoscope is covered with the sheet. Now we have this kind of trays there in which you can put your endoscope like this and you can fill this with the help of cytic solution and in which you can leave it. And the cleaning is very important because the all channels should be dried. So this kind of uh, uh, air blower is there. You can put this air blower into every hole, which are there like suction holes, and you can clean this thoroughly so that nothing should be remain in the channel and can it is absolutely dry. These are the modern gadgetries. In COVID era, you have to keep this along with you so that you can sterilize your flexible endoscope completely, it not cost much. So examination of the dynamic evaluation of the larynx. Uh, as you can see, we can examine larynx during inspiration, expiration, during phonation, and you can do flexible uh, stroboscopy also along with the flexible endoscope in which you can see the mucosal wave and you can pick up any hidden region, paradoxical movement of the vocal cord, arytenoid dislocation, as I have discussed previously. This is a sleep apnea worker, workup in which you can see, you 
can see the circular collapse. And here you see adequate space is there. There is no collapse in first. Also, you can see very much in, uh, you can see what space is there for you and what you have to do. This is the typical feature of the GERD and LPR in which you can have the region over the arytenoid or sometimes in an initial finding arytenoids are very much congested. So how we can help in the difficult intubation, you can just uh, put a xylocaine 4% through the crico thyroid membrane. I'm just pushing it. You can see the bubbles in the my needle. After pushing patient will, I have withdrawn the needle. You can see the bubble that we are in the trachea. Now I will push it one ml, patient will cough and this will is spread over trachea as well as over below the vocal cord and everywhere. Now what I'm doing, I have just railroaded my uh, endotracheal tube over the flexible scope. And I'm just, my scope is going ahead. Then I will push this tube and you can see the edge of the tube. And I'm pushing right now. I'm fixed just above the carina. You can very well see. I am standing there and now I'm pushing the tube through the uh, nasal root. And you can see the edge of the tube now. And I have, I am now withdrawn my scope. So it's very easy. You railroad your uh, tube, how it is done, I will show you in the external picture also. So it's a two minutes job, even in emergency in ICU, you can very well uh, intubate this patient in all those conditions, you can intubate. It's a front, already the patient is already awake. I am just pushing the tube. You have to just decongest the nose properly and you can see in which there is DNS is not there so that there should not be any trauma. Okay. And with my experience, I can tell you that even the seven number or 7.5 number tracheostomic tube in adult, you can very well and easily intubate. If you have very small endoscope, uh, very thin endoscope, you can even intubate the pediatric patient also. But be careful because these thin endoscopes are very fragile. Sometimes if you put a lot of pressure, you can injure your endoscope also. I lost my one endoscope when I was injuring one of the patients who has got the TNT or This is another indication which is known as the Muller's Maneuver in which we will tell patients to do the reverse Valsalva and we see which part is collapsing, whether it's a base of tongue or it's a soft palate area. But the more and more popular method, this is the FES, which is known as the flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, in which we are giving different consistency of the fluid. First, I will give the curd, and I will see whether curd is going into the respiratory area or not. And subsequently, I am going to give the Coca-Cola. At that time, I have got these two drinks with me. Ideally, we should have a different consistency of fluid, like we can have a carrot juice, which is red in color. And we can give them a curd, which is very thick in consistency, or some milkshake we can give them. It has been seen that the food which are more viscous, they tend to go very easily. But the fluid, uh, fluids, they are uh, going to be aspirated by the heavy patients. So that is how we can do. And people in Western country, a lot of FES studies are done and by which they can predict the uh, rice tube weaning, as well as when we can start which kind of fluid or different swimming technique. You can see the curd is coming there and curd is parking there. It is not going towards the vocal cord, but fluid can go between the vocal cords. Accordingly, we can advise them type of food which they take, type of uh, uh, swelling technique like uh, chin tuck technique or which technique they will follow so that they should not aspirate. DICE, everybody knows nowadays DICE is the extended investigation in which it is a drug induced sleep endoscopy. We give uh, one tenth of the propofol and you can see the circular collapse here very clearly and we see which part of the uh, uh, respiratory tract is collapsing and what uh, we have to do in surgical procedure. You can see the snoring is there, fluttering of the soft palate, you can see very well. But we can see that only snoring is there, but other parts are relatively having good area. So this may need 
little procedure over the palate only. So we can decide very well ki what steps we have to take. take. It's another picture in which you can see again the circular collapse is there. You have to keep the endoscope just as the nasopharynx to see everything. So these are the different methods in which flexible scope is very useful and you can very well decide which procedure you have to do. This is another patient, how we do that. Um, I am putting a laryngoscope in place of bronchoscope in which I have connected my spice camera with the storage endoscope. You, if you don't have any chip on tip camera, then also picture is not bad. You can see this because everybody has a flexible scope. Your anesthetist should be very smart so that your patient should not go into the deep sleep. Uh, he should be having light sleep should not be under anesthesia like you see I will show you my patient is moving his mouth and everything but at the same time he is having snoring also you have to walk, you always do this procedure in operation theater because you have to see his oxygen saturation every time intermittently you may use uh, oxygen supplementation to these patients, like we are going through the nose and oxygen is there supplemented through the mouth. You can see the patient is moving his lips, even moving his hand. So that kind of uh, control anesthesia you have to give so that you can really realize the actual condition of the patient when he is sleeping. Now I will show you the NBI and this is with the chip of tip camera. The picture of chip of tip is definitely much better than, uh, it's a case of viral papilloma. You can see that vocal cord has got the polyps there. The whole vocal cord has become the polypoidal. This patient is already been operated by once by laser by Nukur and subsequently patient again developed this kind of viral papilloma. So I am just on the instruction of her, I am doing this flexible endoscopy and she was telling me that you should give me the NBI image also. So fortunately this Olympus has got the NBI image also. NBI in which Dr. Rakesh Srivastava from Lucknow also published a book on NBI imaging and different inferences of NBI imaging. But these all things are with this Olympus scope which is, uh, I mean costly, not costing less than 18 lakh rupees. But believe me, it's an instrument worth. You can see all prominent blood vessels. As soon as I will put into the NBI image, it will become very prominent. I will just switch on the NBI mode so that you can appreciate what NBI look like. So it becomes black and the you see it. Like this is the NBI mode in which all the blood vessels becomes very prominent. Any hidden region is there. The NBI if you study the NBA, you can very well pick up all those lesions without doing biopsy or you can have a preliminary idea that with what pathology you are dealing with. Now I am going to show you the video which is a very interesting video in which doctor, I invited Dr. Jay Kumar Manan to Bhopal and there are very prominent uh, speak, uh, singer, they are singing Drupad Gayan and Gundesha Bandhus are very famous, unfortunately one of them is no more now. And Dr. Jack Kumar was there in the Gundisha Bandhu's place and they have got different problems in taking high note or giving some uh, alab in which what Jack Kumar Menon did, he put a flexible endoscope through nose and tell them to sing and kindly tell me what problems you have. And this session was gone till the evening and it was such an interesting uh, session. And this is the beauty of the flexible endoscope that you can even the well, Maestro is singing and you can examine his larynx and listen his problem and address the solution. So I just have a very short video of uh, that you will enjoy it, I think. Gandesha <laughs> Bandhu himself is singing and the Jai Kumar is doing a pleasure. Thank you. 
So that is what I just want to, in conclusion, I want to just emphasize that the flexible, flexible endoscope can wonder. We can see that uh, how the Jack Kumar is doing the flexible endoscopy in those professional singer and giving them solution that how can improve. And after that, when, then after one month, I met Gundecha and asked him whether you are benefited with those maneuvers or not. He was telling that it's amazing. I want to establish a voice lab in my own uh, Gurukul. So there is a lot of thing which flexible endoscope can do. Definitely you have to have brain and you have to have good training along with your seniors to learn those things. A lot of things have to be done there. And flexible endoscope is one of the integral part or the tool for doing it. So the fiber optic flexible endoscope is an excellent tool for any practicing ENT surgeon in today's scenario. It helps to address the following problems efficiently. That is office-based laryngeal procedure, difficult intubation, work of fast snoring and sleep apnea as an effective ancillary tool for critically ill patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dubey, for this nice lecture. So we will take uh, all the questions after all the three sessions. Okay. So uh, right now we will have Dr. Deepak Haldipur. He will speak on laser stapedectomy. He, I think he also needs no introduction, but he was an alumnus of Bangalore Medical College. He was past president of AOI, consultant ENT surgeon, and founder chairman of Trustwell Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Deepak Haldipur, please. Deepak sir, unmute kariye, apne aapko unmute kariye. Right, Le left side mein ek hoga na, mic dikh raha so unmute kariye. Or uh, Dinesh, if you can do him, unmute. Yaar, unmute to karo unko. Uh, Dr. Deepak, you are not unmuted yourself. You need to unmute before that. So, you, if you're uh, uh, I, very... I you can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't find the arrow as usual. Yeah. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the Centaur Pharmaceuticals. And I know Dr. Satya Prakash Dubey has been instrumental in stringing this program together. It is always a pleasure to meet my three brothers. And this is one group where all the three are younger to me. 
Sanjay Agarwal, Satya Prakash Dubey and Dwaipayan in that order of age, though not necessarily in the order of presidentship. Uh, I am talking here on stapedotomy and probably a few videos of the technique of laser stapedotomy. Stapedotomy is a 62-year-old surgery in the world now, having started in 1958. The beauty of this surgery, among all the surgeries, is whether you have done 500, whether you have done 1,000, whether you have done 6,000, tomorrow's surgery or today's surgery, you are still a little apprehensive. Like how you are meeting a girlfriend for the first time, your heart is always beating. And despite thousands of lectures, thousands of demonstrations, I must confess, even now, stapy surgery is a niche segment where only a few surgeons, compared to the total percentage of the ENT surgeons, are able to carry out this surgery with a fair degree of assurance and safety. So let me go through the journey of the stapy surgery. See, in the history itself, with uh, experience, you can pick up your stapes patients. These patients are typically soft-spoken because they have the phenomenon of autophony. So they hear their voice loud and everybody else very softly. So they are soft-spoken. Number two, we had read in our undergraduate, postgraduate books about paracusis villisi. So these people hear very well in a noisy place or a marketplace. But another typical history that they give is when they're chewing their food or chewing a burfi or papad, they just cannot hear anything. This is a typical history. And uh, then we come on to the tests. Now, it's very important, I think, uh, that we conduct the tuning fork test properly. For a case which is good for AP surgery, three to four points are very important. Number one, the tuning fork test, the Rene should be negative. Number two, the Webers should get lateralized to the affected ear. Number three, the speech discrimination score after adequate masking should be above at least 50% for you to get some degree of result in a stapy surgery. Then comes the masking and speech discrimination. The Masking generally has to be at the level of 60 dB. When a patient comes to you with bilateral hearing loss or unilateral very large hearing loss, you have to do what is called as insert masking, in which the masking can go up to 90 dB because the crossover occurs at the 45 dB level. In the impedance audiometry, you typically get an AS type curve and when you do the stepedial tendon reflex study, if the stepedial tendon reflex is strongly present, then it is unlikely to be a case of otosclerosis. Now, there is this investigation, the vestibular evoked myogenic potential. It has a very, very limited role. It need not be done in every case of stapes. In those cases where you want to differentiate a superior semicircular canal descent syndrome, from otosclerosis, the WEMP is positive in SSCC, whereas in otosclerosis, you don't find the WEMP. Now, the radiological investigations, namely CT scan, MRI, CBCT scan, are gaining more and more importance, even the autoacoustic emissions. When do you test the autoacoustic emissions? When you're looking at a malignant otosclerosis or an advanced otosclerosis where you have to plan a cochlear implantation, OEE test also becomes very important. So in tuning fork test, it's very important that you learn to do the absolute bone conduction test. A well done tuning fork test is worth its weight in gold even when it is compared to a pure tone audiometry. Now, as I told you earlier, in the pure tone audiometry, I've already talked about masking, the insert masking, and the speech discrimination. You have to be extremely careful when you get a patient with intact tympanic membrane, 
with a conductive hearing loss because many times a long standing sn loss unilateral can actually present as a conductive loss on the audiometer in the early part of my career i have had about four cases where i did a tympanotomy only to find that the foot plate was very freely mobile and i could not continue the surgery and i had to cut a sorry figure in front of the patient and the relatives so if you can do a good hearing aid trial with good masking of the contralateral ear if possible insert masking then you can definitely differentiate a sensory neural loss from a false positive conductive loss shown on the audiogram coming to kerhart's notch during our postgraduate days we were taught that kerhart's notch was typical in otosclerosis and it is usually typically seen in 2000 hertz but now the concepts have changed kerhart's notch can be seen in multiple other conditions as well and it need not necessarily be seen at 2000 hertz itself though the presence of kerhart's notch at 2000 hertz still goes more in favor of otosclerosis though not always and kerhart's notch as we all are aware is due to that loss of bone conduction component due to the fixation of the stay piece in the impedance we get a typical as curve which i mentioned already and if the stapedial reflex is strongly present it is unlikely to be an otosclerosis and i also spoke about the web and uh, now coming to the imaging when would you like to do a ct scan in otosclerosis why do you like to do a ct scan in otosclerosis what would you see in a ct scan in otosclerosis number 2 when would you like to do an mri scan if at all in otosclerosis now whenever i have a doubt about a diagnosis that is in a unilateral otosclerosis number 1 in very young children coming to me with a normal tympanic membrane and no fluid in the mid ear in children where i have to rule out the anomalies of the ossicular chain or to know about congenital otosclerosis or in patients who have come to me with conductive hearing loss with episodes of vertigo where i can rule out cochlear otosclerosis or patients who come to you with tinnitus in patients who come to me with tinnitus when i do a ct scan if it shows cochlear otosclerosis then i will be telling my patients the chances of this tinnitus disappearing after a successful stapedotomy really become less or they dwindle even in patients whom i have to do a revision stapedotomy or when there is a mixed hearing loss where apart from the conductive component the bone conduction is showing a dip i would like to do a ct scan study now you can either do a hr ct or a cbct now this cone beam ct is a much cheaper investigation but we have to remember that compared to all other diseases in otosclerosis cone beam ct is a far superior investigation than even the best multiplanar ct machine because it can give us 0.05 mm cuts of the foot plate number 2 it utilizes 17 times less radiation number 3 you can accurately measure the thickness of the foot plate also preoperatively number 4 the scan can be done in a sitting position number 5 a cone beam ct costs much lesser and occupies much less space in your ent countries it is also used in pregnant ladies with a degree of safety number 7 uh, in uh, patients who have got dental implants metallic implants there are no artifacts in a cone beam ct so cone beam ct is far superior to an hr ct in otosclerosis now what all things do we see in hr ct when we again were doing our post graduation we were very much worried about a perilymph gusher and we were obsessed with any information which we can get preoperatively to rule out a perilymph gusher we were also taught repeatedly that an abnormally present 
cochlear aqueduct communication is the cause of pen lymph gusha the surprising thing is a ct scan showing a wide cochlear aqueduct has got nothing to do with a perilymph gusher perilymph gusher on the contrary is seen whenever you see a enlarged vestibular aqueduct on a ct scan or when you see a dilated internal acoustic canal or when you see an abnormal cochlear communication with the csr the enlarged cochlear aqueduct almost never is connected with a perilymph gusher the ct scan will give me very good impression or information about a decent facial nerve whether the facial nerve is covering the foot plate completely whether i should try doing the surgery on the opposite side if it is a bilateral otosclerosis it will also give me any information about the high jugular bulge it will also give me an information about the third window and mind you we were again taught the third window means typically a superior semicircular canal deficient situation now you can diagnose superior semicircular canal deficiency in two ways number one the vamp is present which is absent in otosclerosis number two the hrct shows a dehiscence number three if you do an audiogram in a superior canal dehiscence you will always find that the bone conduction curve is going supra normal to minus 10 minus 20d that is very important and finally the uh, length of the piston suppose you have done a surgery and on the seventh day you find that the patient is still having giddiness a small component of sn loss coming in you would like to know whether your piston has been a little too long the ct scan will tell you whether your piston is very i mean too long but remember when it comes to the length of the piston there is a 0.1 mm error in the assessment of the ct scan which you have to apply as a correction factor persistent stapedial artery now in a hrct there are two points which you have to concentrate number one the facial nerve tympanic segment if it appears double in its thickness on the ct scan it is because the persistent stapedial artery also goes in the fallopian canal parallel to the tympanic segment you have to suspect persistent stapedial artery situation number 2 in the same patient look for the foramen spinosum if the foramen spinosum is absent this patient definitely has a persistent stapedial artery and you have to be careful during the surgery you can also diagnose ossicular fixation on the ct scan typically the otosclerotic focus is a demineralized spongy bone vascular bone which is commonly found in fissula antefenestrum in the anterior part of the foot plate but there are conditions where you can have malleus fixation so there your ct scan will clearly show an ossification of the anterior malleolar ligament or the superior malleolar ligament or the posterior incudal ligament and as i told you earlier you can know the foot plate thickness as well to plan for the surgery in a ct scan now we plan auto acoustic emission in cochlear implantation cases when do we do an mri in auto sclerosis if you have a patient of auto sclerosis who also has a complaint of recurrent attacks of vertigo if you can do a gadolinium enhanced mri scan gadolinium is absorbed by the perilymph but not by the endolymph which means the shadow created you can clearly make out a subclinical high drops and you can tell the patient very clearly that they can go for a hearing aid because the chances of getting an sn loss and persistent post operative vertigo is going to be more common because they already have subclinical endolymphatic high drops then it is also good enough for us to know the cochlear otosclerosis and in a perilymph fistula situation to diagnose a perilymph fistula especially on the seventh post operative day if there is still a perilymph leak due to long piston 
An MRI with gadolinium will clearly show you the leak of the perilymph. So a CT scan and MRI are here to stay. Now, finally, let me come to the videos. Uh, one sec. In this, all that I would say, two points are important. Number one, the upper incision should go at least about two millimeters anterior to the malleus so that you can look for the movement of the malleus and rule out fixation of the malleus because of ossification or high of the anterior malleolar ligament. Second, please place the incision not too medially because then it can fall short when you remove too much of an overhang. Don't place it too laterally, then it can become very bulky and keep on coming in the way when you're doing your surgery. So you can see me elevating here. The most important thing here is not to give a tear of the tympanic membrane and not to damage the corda. Only thing is, I don't use a speculum. I use a, a Lempert's endoral speculum and not the Toyn B speculum. If you can comfortably put in a 6 millimeter size Toyn B speculum, you can do the surgery endomyopathy. If a 6 millimeter speculum cannot comfortably fit in, it is a narrow canal, then you better go on to Sanjay Agarwal's approach of endoral stapedotomy. So the 6 millimeter is a critical mark. This to me is the second most important step in the entire steps we do in stapy surgery. The revisions which I have done, the commonest thing that I saw was there was no adequate overhang removal. If you are using a curate, take bigger shavings away from the calda, that is superiorly, as you come inferiorly, closer to the calda, the shaving should be really in very small strips. And you should remove the overhang till you can see the base of the pyramid comfortably. If you are a person who is using a titanium piston, then your posterior overhang removal has to be much more wider. You can clearly see now the base of the pyramid and see the exposure. You can even see the facial nerve there, uh, a small thickness. You should be able to see about half the width of the facial nerve. That way your instrumentation in the further steps of the surgery becomes very, very easy. Now coming to the corda tympani. It is ideal if you can decompress the corda and take it out of harm's way. If by chance you have overstretched the corda or your corda is partially damaged, it is far better for you to give a sharp cut on the corda so that the compensatory mechanisms start working. And generally, between two months to nine months, most of these patients recover their taste sensation because of the crossover from the auriculotemporal nerve and other branches of the trigeminal nerve in the infratemporal fossa. Now, you try to check for the IS joint fixation and the, you try to check for the mobility. So here, you try to see the incus. The incus is seen very clearly there. The corda is out of the harm's way and you palpate for the incus there. Similarly, you palpate for the mobility of the malleus. And the best place to check for the mobility of the malleus is at the neck of the malleus. You can also appreciate the anterior otosclerotic focus at this point, which you can see. Now comes the dislocating the IS joint. So you can use a IS joint. See, this is a small right angled hook. You can use that. Or you can use a very nice IS joint knife designed by the Medtronic, which also does the job equally nicely. Now, this is where I take my CO2 laser. And covering the 
foot plate with a gel foam soaked with blood. Now I am focusing the beam here where the cursor is, and uh, you can see the helium neon beam is getting slowly focused there, and you start firing the laser. You can keep it anywhere between four to six watts and take two to four shots. And then once you suck the smoke, you can see with hardly any displacement, the total tendon is completely vaporized. Now you can see the once the tendon is vaporized, you have to fire on the posterior cross. Now this tendinotomy or removing the stapes uh, tendon or cutting the stapes tendon before the laser came in, I would use the scissors. And this is what I would do. And now what we do is we do it with the laser. So here the wattage is fixed between 10 to 12 watts. And again, I'm focusing on the posterior crust, not forgetting the covering of the foot plate with a gel foam soaked in blood. Again, you take three to four shots Many times, even if you can weaken the complete posterior crust, that itself should be enough. But you can vaporize the entire posterior crust. You can take as many shots as you want. The most important thing is you must give a two seconds gap between each shot of the laser. You can see most of it is weakened. Now, postcrotum using skeeter, I will not play that just for the you know for being repetitive. Now, once the the posterior crust is vaporized, it is so easy to actually now take away the superstructure of the stapes because it is completely vaporized and there is hardly any movement of the foot plate. You can see the foot plate is rock solid. For me, the most important critical step in the entire surgery of stapes is the posterior curotomy. Though making a single shot opening of the foot plate looks more spectacular, all the headaches and heartbreaks of stapes are with the step of posterior curotomy. The second important step, of course, as I told you earlier, is adequate overhang removal. Now comes the next one, the overhang removal using the skeeter. I will not play that. I think uh, this is the overhang being removed, I think, near the pyramid using a skeeter. And then now we create a fenestra using the laser. Keeping the wattage at 20 watts and the aperture at 0.8, or 0.7, sometimes 0.6, I take a single shot of the laser and with one single shot, you can see a very nice circumscribed 0.6 millimeter hole created in the foot plate. And once you fire this shot, if you find that the labyrinth is full of perilinth, this patient will not get into any SN loss due to the laser. When you fire repeated shots on an open vestibule and create a dry labyrinth, you can have a SN loss or a dead ear due to laser. Penestra created by perforator, I wouldn't like to go into that because my talk was more towards a stepidotomy only. Piston placement and crimping. Of course, once this is done, because your overhang removal has been adequate, your foot plate has been rock solid, you have measured the length properly. Now, there are surgeons who put in a fixed length piston in every case. I think it is unfair. When we are in an era where a person's refractory error in each eye requires different power glasses to have one single fit of a piston for every case, Every single length is not correct and definitely you will have your failures. So always measure the length and put the piston. Now coming to sealing the fenestra, ideally you can put a drop of blood. Now there is a confusion 
that if blood gets into the vestibule, what happens? The vestibule has much higher fluid pressure than the entire mid layer. Unless you make the mistake of sucking the labyrinth with a large suction tip on the vestibule itself, make it dry, and then only the blood can get into the vestibule. Even if there is bleeding in the mid layer during your stay piece surgery, you need not worry because the pressure of the vestibular perilim is so high, it will never allow blood to get into the inner layer. So only when you do a suction, create a relatively dry labyrinth, the blood gets in there, which is rich in potassium, and this potassium can be detrimental to the hair cells and cause the hair cell loss. So the second best material to put is the vein graft. Our seniors were using tragal perichondrium. Now the perichondrium is totally given up because research has shown that when you use perichondrium on the vestibule, there have been instances of cartilage generation and regrowth, and again a conductive loss. You can use full fascia as well. Now, there are certain questions which come up in our mind when we think of a stapy surgery. Number one, what is the minimum airborne gap for which you would operate? It should be at least 25 dB to 30 dB. The Rene's has to be negative. The speech discrimination score has to be more than 50%. What is congenital otosclerosis? This is where the annular ligament is absent. Sometimes you may have to do a stapes in a child as young as four years or five years. But the results in congenital uh, fixation of the foot plate, you doing a stapes, the results are excellent. What is juvenile otosclerosis? Seen between the age group of 16 and 18. Now, this is a very cumbersome procedure because usually the vascular bone, it's a very spongy bone. They tend to do a lot during surgery. It's a very messy work. There will be a lot of additions post-operatively. So these are difficult cases to do compared to congenital otosclerosis. When would you allow the patient to fly after a stapes? One or two months after doing the stapedotomy, do an impedance audiometry where you build the pressure up to 400 millimeters of water, not mercury, 400 millimeters of water. The tympanic membrane becomes rock solid. That is at a point where the piston gets displaced to the maximum depth of 0.5 millimeter into the vestibule. If your patient does not have vertigo, this patient can go for flying as well as deep sea diving. Now coming to the measuring the length, as I told you earlier, it is always important to measure the length. Don't put a single fit. Which are the best materials? The time-tested proven materials are Teflon and Titanium. The only disadvantage is Titanium it is expensive. Number two, if you have to do a revision, there will be a lot more difficult to do a titanium revision compared to a Teflon revision. The disadvantage with Teflon, if you don't crimp it properly, you can have a differentiated loose piston and you can have an incus necrosis in the long run. Now, Ferrestar diameter. You can either make a 0.6 mm diameter and put in a 0.4 piston or you can make a 0.8 mm diameter fenestra and put in a 0.6 mm piston. What is important is there should be a 2 mm, 0.2 mm space all around the piston. Is there a role for Rosen's mobilization operation, which was there before stapedotomy? Only in a small subset of young children who have an airborne gap of 20 decibels who are unwilling to wear the hearing aid. You can try this. Later on, as they grow up, they go in for a refixation when you can go ahead and do a full-blown stapedotomy. What is laser stamp procedure? It has fallen out of vogue now. It was being done before. It is not successful at all, where we use the laser to vaporize the anterior crust. And finally, they are talking about the complications. Before I conclude my talk, number one, perilymph gusher. CT scan will give you enough information. If you find a gusher on the table, please wait. Many times waiting itself will weaken the gusher after the CSO flows. Please complete the stapedotomy. Number two, if you have made a small control hole and the gusher starts, don't be scared. 
widen the gusher widen the opening put in a fat and don't leave the fat there a piston has to be sitting there on the fat it is mandatory more than hearing the piston forms a very good seal for the gusher and number 3 if you have a gusher you can also use a lumbar drain steroids or manitol to bring down the pressure and complete the stapedotomy coming to sensory neural hearing loss now sensory neural hearing loss if you get it you have to go back and see whether the piston is too long and also try giving intratympanic steroids and oral steroids if you have a floating foot plate if you have a laser you can fire the laser if you don't have a laser use a fish hook and extract the foot plate go in for a total stapedectomy and if the facial nerve is decent use a dry gel foam press about 4 or 5 piece of gel foam on the decent facial nerve it will absorb the fluid the facial nerve will shrink you will get enough space to complete the stapedotomy if it is really too big and not giving you space please abandon the surgery try on the other side or go for a hearing aid in perilin fistula you have to go back and put in a vein graft excise the fistula tube complete the stapedotomy if the piston is long put in a small piston if there is a persistent airborne gap even after a successful stapedotomy after a month or two please go back do a tympanotomy you will usually find a necrosed incus or a displaced piston a piston gets displaced if the piston is short number 1 or if the piston is sitting obliquely in the fenestra hinging against the bone and not having a free movement and the incus necrosis occurs if you have not crimped the teflon piston properly over the incus and uh, i think cochlear otosclerosis and sometimes when you are over zealously curating the overhang you can have a accidental dislocation of the incus try to reposition the incus in the incudomalleolar joint if it is possible do that and go ahead and complete the stapedotomy for some chance you are unable to do that just reposition the incus close the case go back after 6 months do a stapedotomy or number 3 you can do a malleus stapedotomy the problem is with the malleus stapedotomy the hearing results in the long run are not as good as a conventional stapedotomy i have spoken about the oval endo seal when do we do the surgery on the other ear you can do the surgery on the other ear only if the surgery on the first ear was totally uneventful and it can be done exactly one year after you have done on the other side second while doing the first stapedotomy if you find obliterative otosclerosis in that ear and if the patient has otosclerosis in the other ear it is mandatory that in obliterative otosclerosis you do stapes on the other ear in the next ear because in obliterative otosclerosis this focus releases the enzymes which can gradually damage the cochlea if it is left unoperated i think the lecture was too long i am coming to the last slide in sensory neural hearing loss the you know on the table you can assess that this particular patient may have a chance of sm loss if you have aspirated the perilymph with your larger suction accidentally over the vestibule immediately fill up that place with ringer lactate solution remember ringer lactate is more physiological than saline don't put saline in floater i have already described if you accidental partial or total platinectomy cover with a vein graft or full fascia put in a piston and don't fire laser on the open vestibule i already told you what to do with the gusher i already spoke about blood in the vestibule when would you do a revision stapes of your own or anybody else ideal period wait for 6 months and then embark on revision if you have a laser it is a big advantage and usually you will either find a short piston or an oblique piston or a necrosed incus malignant otosclerosis the last slide it's an advanced otosclerosis where you have two options if the rene 
I mean, if the speech discrimination score is around 50, 60%, you can still do a stay piece and then give a hearing aid. If the speech discrimination score is less than 50%, around 30%, please go in for a cochlear implantation. Stay piece will not help and hearing aid will not help. The disadvantages of the laser, someday the machine may not work. It is an expensive machine. Annual maintenance cost is very expensive. If the cauda is coming in the way, if the facial is coming in the way, you cannot fire the laser. In obliterative otosclerosis, you have to blue foot plate first using the drill and then fire the laser. In a narrow hole window niche, you cannot fire it. If you don't have a fiber laser, you cannot fire on the anterior crust. That was too much of an information. I think I have completed the talk. you to be in the second situation rather than the first situation when you do your stapes. I know I crammed up too much information in this but I had to because it is such a complex surgery even now and I'm scared doing this even now. Thank you very much. And over to my brother Sanjay Agarwal. Uh, uh, just one word about him. He's an extremely laid back person, tries to underplay himself in an era where everybody is busy marketing themselves. People like Sanjay are very rare, and I'm very proud of him. Thank you, Dr. Deepak Gandhipur, for your elaborative description of uh, stepy surgery. But you have also given the answers of all the probable questions made my life easy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal also needs no introduction. Uh, he was past president of AY. He has special interest in ear, sinus, and skull base surgery. He, he had advanced training for ear and sinus surgery from Mumbai, Bokum, Urzbark, Fulda, Zurich, and Graz. He had delivered lots of uh, guest lectures in many national and international conferences. As we all know, he was the convener in AY Indoor Conference, and he was also scientific chairman of Historical Asia Oceania Conference in Hyderabad. Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, please. He will speak on endoscopy this year. Thank you, Zoyapan. And thank you, Center Pharma, for arranging this webinar. And my brothers, Dr. Deepak Haldipur and Chatya Prakash Dubey. Can you see the share screen, Dwaipan? Yeah. So my talk will be on... It very, very clearly. Yeah, thank you. It is on endoscopic DCR, tips to improve the results. What we are, or what we want to achieve is in the cases of epiphora, we want the eye should be made dry of this. And what is called as nasur in Hindi, the patient should get rid of it. This surgery was initially done only by ophthalmologists, but after the advent of endoscope and the approach being very superior to the external DCR. Now all the ophthalmology colleagues are referring the patients to the ENT surgeons. At this point, I must tell to all my dear friends and the junior colleagues 
want to start their career as an endoscopic sinus surgeon this is the surgery first to pick because if you can meticulously learn the steps this is a very rewarding surgery coming to the procedure proper as usual there are some anatomical variation which we should keep in mind like the lacrimal bone usually it is a thin bone but it may be thick and hard it may be absent so we have to take care in raising the flap about the anterior lacrimal crest it may not be prominent and then it becomes very difficult in getting the first punch especially for the junior surgeons lacrimal fossa we should know it lies approximately 5 to 8 mm anterior to the ancillary process sometime it lies posteriorly and then it is very difficult in finding the sac the configuration of ethmoid air cells should be understood and there are variations in the ethmoid air cell system this picture i have brought from dr milin navlake and about the dimensions these are the approximate dimensions of the lacrimal system in normal adult even though they vary from person to person this dimensions knowledge is very helpful during the surgery this endoscopic dcr about the anesthesia all the adult dcr can be very well done under local anesthesia we use xylocan 2% with adrenaline endoscopically local is given just anterior to the ancillary process a small amount is also injected on the middle turbinate so that when we manipulate the middle turbinate patient may not feel the pain also it is advisable to externally inject the area of lacrimal sac with the same solution and as you know this is the area of our interest area of lacrimal sac this is the left side septum this is the middle turbinate and this is the glimpse of ancillary process so one should focus on the area to be approached now what i am going to do is i will show two small films of the procedure first we'll have a short titles also of the steps so that we can understand it this is endoscopic view we cauterize the incision line then raising of the flap is done this is left side of the nostril bone removal getting the first punch and as we get the first punch we can move the sac further bone removal is done adequate sac exposure is done here i am using a 11 number blade now we use the keratome as per advice of dr dube incision on the sac the mucoprolen discharge is evident then we remove the medial wall of the sac and the whole sac is open syringing and we must get a free flow we also use diluted methylene blue which is very helpful in marking you can see the common canaliculus and then this is post op positive tear test you can see the opening this is just the steps of the operation i will show one more clip 
this is right side endonasal dcr infiltration is being done just anterior to the uncinate process that i usually make a habit to feel also where to make a flap where to cauterize this helps if cautery is not available maybe some means of ophthalmic centers then without cautery also you can very well do but cautery makes your life easy as the bleeding is less this is the raising of flap again as in the last case and this is getting the first punch and as you get please bite and then like we are biting and then release it and then remove it the punch has to be released there so if by accident the lacrimal mucosa has come sac mucosa it will not get tear down further bone removal you can see this is again the incision on the sac this was the case of empyma so lot of mucopurulent discharge was there and as you see the interior of the sac the mucosa of the interior of the sac wall due to the chronic infection it is edematous now we are removing the medial wall of the sac and a good size opening has to be established in this sac again using the methylene blue diluted this also helps in delineating all the sac walls making our field prominent you can see the free flow now there are sometimes mucus plugs so it is always advisable to wash and get a free flow now coming to the intraoperative problems during the endonasal dcr the first and foremost is the bleeding we must achieve a bloodless field and when we achieve a good field so proper preparation before the surgery if you are doing under local anesthesia at least half an hour 20 minutes before the surgery we put pack the nose with 4% xylocan with adrenaline and then we inject and proper bleeding control is done second problem can be not getting the first punch this is really a problem when you are not able to get the punch then it is advisable to go till the uncinate and then you can manage the case sometime the bone is very thick honestly i rarely used a drill but i have seen surgeons using the drill but a good punch and uh, as per advice of our dr dubey you should not hesitate to use the bigger punches because the small punches will not help when the bone is very thick fourth will be the not finding the sac if in spite of all the things you are not able to find the sac then you take the help of probing and then you can manage sometimes there is accidental opening of ethmoids which won't affect but opening of the orbit is something will be serious so we must take care as i told you even after doing everything you are not getting flow on syringe so don't be in a panic sometimes there are thick mucus plugs with syringing and probing you will be able to manage 
You will also get cases of decrocystitis with external fistula. This also can be very well managed by endonasal DCR and the repair of fistula can be done. For the post-operative care, it is a day care procedure. Post-operatively, the patient has the nasal peg, which is removed after 24 hours. Oral broad spectrum antibiotics, analgesics, anti-inflammatory, antihistaminic, local ophthalmic drops should be given for a week. Nasal drop helps to remove the crust and keep the operative area clean. Liquid paraffin can be used for cleaning and lubrication. And all sinus surgeons know about the nasal dose, gel neti. So endonasal DCR patients post-operatively are also advised to wash their nose with alkaline solution at least twice daily. The complications of the surgery, as I told something in the problems, intraoperatively there can be excessive bleeding, not finding the set, opening of the orbit. Also post-operatively, there can be swelling of the eye. There can be subcutaneous emphysema, which can be treated very well by the massage of the eye and local eye fermentation. But the failure of surgery remains the worst complication. When we were in the era 15, 20 years back, and uh, we are getting these cases from the ophthalmologist, so we used to do a lot of our lectures with the ophthalmic society, showing our films, trying to convince them. Now the new generation, our ENT surgeons, get this a clear field that ophthalmologists, now they are more busy with the lens implant and all this LASIK work. So this surgery has come to the ENT. But here I would like to mention the external DCR has the same success rate as the endonasal DCR. There is, these are not coming to ENT because of the success rate, but this has come to ENT because of the following advantages. It has our external DCR. It avoids facial scars between eye and the nose and does also avoids the scar complications. Endoscopically, by directly assessing the sac, it limits tissue damage, surgical trauma, and the angular vein damage, thus preserving the canthal anatomy. Reduced operative time, so reduced morbidity. Reduced intraoperative bleeding. It can be done in acute decrocystitis. This is the biggest advantage. External DCR can never be done in acute decrocystitis. This endonasal DCR can be very well done in local anesthesia. Simultaneously, we can treat nasal pathologies like septal deviation, polyps. It is a daycare surgery and it's a cost effective. So these were the distinct advantages of endonasal DCR. In Madhya Pradesh, especially Dr. Satya Prakash has done maximum number of cases. And then I have done the next number of cases. So I have just put the results of the last 200 cases. In six of my cases done endonasally, there was not adequate flow on syringing after one week. So these were examined endoscopically. And it was found that the middle terminate was adhering to the open sac area and thus blocking the passage. And just releasing that, we could manage that. In three of our cases, revision has to be done because the opening got closed. In one of the cases, I remember, the say could not be localized. Thus, it was taken under general anesthesia 
after doing a CT scan, paranasal sinus. It was found that the bone was deformed and the patient initially did not give a history of facial trauma he had in the past. Otherwise, in all of our cases, sec would be localized and the procedure is done. There are few take home messages out of our experience. I can tell you the nasal endoscopic examination is a must before you take any case. Presence of ophthalmologist. This point I would like to emphasize. Though the probing and syringing, every ENT can learn. But you must ask your ophthalmologist to be present because you get all the cases from him and he feels also some importance. So this is a very good tactic to involve him. Then the syringing has to be done. A word about stents. Again, honestly, I will confess, in all primary cases, we do not use stents. I repeat, in all primary cases, we do not use stents. Rather, using stents in all cases creates problem. We use stents in the revision cases. Then a word about post-operative care, I already told, and another about revision cases. Revision cases has to be taken in a different perspective, and you have to be ready with all the gadgets and stents. These are the 10 commandments we have framed with Dr. Dubey, Dr. Deepak. Number one is, if you are unable to see the anterior lacrimal crest, I said you don't panic. Elevate the mucosa till unseen it. You will be able to do the procedure. There should be adequate bone removal superiorly. This is very important. And most of the our colleagues, they do not remove the bone superiorly. They will remove the bone and then start making incision on the sac. You will release the mucopurulent discharge, but you will never be able to see the common canaliculi and the chances of failure are much higher. As I said, number three would be, do not hesitate to use bigger punch. Number two, number three, number four, don't hesitate. Point number four, always try to see the common canaliculi. If not seen, do probing. If available, always use cautery for the incision. This will aid to your bloodless field. As I told, now we use fresh keratome for every case. Give two parallel cut superiorly or inferiorly, and the sac will open like a book. If not, do unsynectomy. Intubation and stenting only in revision cases. And we use also mitomycin C in revision cases. There should be meticulous follow up for first three months. And the last but most important point, again, all the problems arises when you keep on syringing and interfering. So post-operatively, no complaints, no intervention policy. Let the things heal by itself. My sincere thanks to my teacher, Dr. M. V. Kirtane, and for endonasal DCR, I use some slides from Dr. Milind Navlake. And to all my ophthalmology colleagues for showing confidence in me. And lastly, I would like to salute all my seven teachers, Professor Munjal, because of him, I, I'm in ENT. And for my ear surgery training, Professor Hems, Professor Pusalkar and Professor Hildman, and for my sinus surgery training, Professor Stemberger, Professor Draft, and Professor Kirth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, for your nice, lucid presentation regarding the endoscopic DCR. 
sir, and all the three lectures will be a learning experience to lots of PNT surgeons. So right now we are having lots of questions. So I will put forward all these questions one by one. First, Dr. Dubey, please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. So what are the limitations of flexible fiber optic endoscope? I think the one in the foremost uh, limitation is uh, cost. If you want to have a very good chip on tip flexible endoscope, then definitely, definitely cost is probably mostly for the no ICN patient. And another limitation that some office procedure in which you want a magnification and more instruments, if you want to use your two hands because it has got only one channel. So you cannot uh, do a more intricate procedure with flexible endoscope, only a few office procedures you can do. And another thing, if the bleeding is too much, sometimes it is very difficult to control with the flexible scope and this their suction. And at that time, uh, you have to go for rigid scope and our microlaryngoscopic instruments. Okay, I have received lots of questions regarding this issue. Who, what will be your suggestion for safe ENT practice during this COVID-19 era at the time of doing this uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy? Because this is an aerosol generating procedure. Definitely, the aerosol generating procedure is the most uh, dangerous procedure. And as a ENT surgeon, we are the person who are more vulnerable for these infections. We have lost our few colleagues also, one from Patna, one from Mumbai, uh, because they are involved in aerosol procedures. So really, I am telling you, you have to spend money to save yourself. As you know, that uh, virus can go through nose and uh, your mouth, and aerosol can go there. So ideally, as we are discussing, that our uh, joint replacement colleagues are using a striker hood for joint replacement surgery. You go to your uh, orthopedic surgeon colleague and ask them, then what kind of hood you are using. It is costing more. It's worth wearing because you become 100% full proof and uh, without uh, taking proper precaution, you should not uh, do this kind of procedure which are aerosol generating. This hood is very good because it has got a battery operated fan and you have a hole covering till your shoulder and uh, because the air is there inside the mask, uh, you will not feel very claustrophobic because sometimes if we wear the PPE kit, even you can wear your normal gown, and if you have this kind of foot on your head and your shoulder, you can definitely go ahead with your procedure, as far as fiber optic laryngoscopy is concerned. And uh, definitely, uh, for safe practices, now you always have, uh, now ICMR, I think three, four days before, has introduced a rapid antigen test, which is not very costly, and is very well suited for the ENT surgeon, because a rapid antigen test will take a a nasopharyngeal swab and dip it into the viral medium. And after that, you put a cock there and put it onto the slide three drops. And you can see your result then and there. There are studies done in five or six places. It is, as far as the positivity is concerned, it is as reliable as rapid uh, PCR test, which uh, the gold standard. You can do this test in your clinic. Uh, because more and more NABH clinics are being recognized for this. And recently we have written to the letter that the ENT practitioner, because they are more uh, right person to take the nasopharyngeal swab. So they are thinking of uh, making ENT clinics also recognized for using these rapid antigen tests, which is costing only 550 rupees. If you don't have these tests, kindly do the standard uh, PCR test. Though it is costing much, somewhere it is costing 2,500, somewhere it is costing 4,000. But don't bring any patient into your flexible endoscopy room without COVID testing. Right? This you have to do. This is a very strong message to all of us. And uh, some of the ET surgeons from the Puno Surgery Society, like Dr. Amitabh Raichudri in Kolkata, they are suggesting a simple thing. They are putting a three-layer mask to the patient and making a small hole here. And after cutting a gloves, just they are putting here uh, with stapler. 
and then with the fiber optic scope they are just pushing like this so this entire glass will snugly fitted like this so okay. there is no gap and by making this they are doing uh, this procedure but uh, i think it is always beneficial for the safety e to go for covid test prior to all this aerosol generating procedure okay thank you now this is for dr deepak haldipur when i am listening your lecture actually i was thinking that i am reading the book of shambho page by page <laughs> so it was a wonderful lecture and i have received lots of comments regarding in this and uh, one question what is the type of laser used and is there any specific advantages of it over the other types see the carbon dioxide laser is what i used i forgot to tell in the talk the biggest advantage of carbon dioxide laser in stapy surgery is that perilymph absorbs this laser so by chance your laser energy is in excess it is easily absorbed the other laser which is used there ktp or diode laser they depend on the tissue based this thing where the blood absorbs the laser the only disadvantage that carbon dioxide laser has it is not good in hemostasis and it was not available in the fiber form before but now with the occupulse duo you have even a fiber optic option <clears throat> which means you can bend the fiber and then use it on the anterior crust we can use it on the additions so what i have is the luminous occupulse duo ktp laser has its own advantages in other surgeries it's not that carbon dioxide is a be all and end all but in laryngeal surgeries and especially stapy surgery because perilymph absorbs the excessive laser energy it is the best laser okay the next question is sometimes we can put the piston through the fenestra and uh, in cas in a single shot yes. uh, whether repeated try can injure the hearing further in fact if you could see masters like abr desai he would many times take out the piston four to five times and put it back again what we were taught in our first year ms post graduation was the trick of surgery is tissue handling isn't it so if you know how to put it there is nothing wrong there are times when i i generally manage to put it in one go but if i feel the piston is long i have taken it out trimmed it and put it back ideally you must put it in one go but it is not mandatory you can take five to six attempts also as long as you are gentle and you handle the vestibule well okay and have you ever experienced any situation where uh, you had actually abandoned the procedure in between yeah my own puc friend i had to do a stapes on him and he is a tv celebrity and when i opened the first year i found the facial nerve was really very close to the foot plate now my worry was he is my good school friend but the moment if i give him a gentle facial palsy on the tv he will be i will become as famous as him so i had to abandon turn him over to the other side and then did the surgery so if by chance you have to do a stapes on satyaprakash dubey you be very careful because you can't give him a facial palsy you can give it to sanjay agarwal or deepak aldipur it doesn't matter and the next question is in all your cases whether you were referring for ct and mri after going for the audiometry or tuning for test remember one thing ct and mri as showed in the slide is required only in special situation a day may come in our life and mandatorily the government may make the rule or the court may make a rule that you have to do a ct scan on every patient but as of now if you ask me in terms of percentage about 10% of all my patients with otosclerosis will require a ct scan and the ct scan findings make a difference in only 2 to 3% of all the operated patients these two ratios are different please keep it okay and uh, your preferred choice of prosthesis is always stepson my friend satish uses uh, titanium 
I would prefer Teflon because Teflon has not given me much problem. Only thing is you need to crimp properly. That's it. Okay. Now these questions are for Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. Please unmute yourself. Wants to say something. Satya Prakash yeah. wants to yeah. say something. Oh, what, yeah, yeah. Moderator sir, with your permission, I want to ask one question to Dr. Deepak Haldipur. Yes, yes. Uh, Deepak sir, uh, one of my friend from Bangalore only, uh, he is doing uh, STP surgery with diode laser. You have not mentioned that your CO2 laser is uh, prohibitively costly. And you, because you have a big hospital and you are a big man, and if I can count on fingers, the people who have got the CO2 lasers, and the fiber optics which you are talking is is extreme. So he is doing regularly uh, with diode laser, and he is telling me that uh, after setting the wattage, I can uh, do it, and uh, my results are good. So because diode laser is much cheaper, and anybody can afford. No, no, hundred percent. See, hundred percent. There is no question at all. Because see, uh, again, as I keep telling, a fool with a tool is still a fool. That it's not the fault of the tool. So a diode laser can definitely be doing a good work. Uh, only two things. Number one, I am not very good at using the diode laser. I think he's using it well. And obviously, we are all in private practice. Unless we get good results, we cannot consistently do it. My only question is. Uh, I am a medium surgeon, but all the leading lights of uh, STP surgery in the country, if they are using carbon dioxide laser and not diode laser, is there some fact that we are missing? Yeah. If all if all the leading otology surgeons of the country, lot of them who are also doing prolific endoscopic sinus surgery, are not doing endoscopic ear surgery prolifically, I think. It's not that they can't hold the endoscope, or they don't know how to use the endoscope. Maybe, maybe it's still not up to that mark of CO2. But as you said correctly, in our country, cost is a very, very important thing. And obviously, he must be getting good result because nobody in private practice will do a procedure which is not giving good results. It's like I've seen Ashish Bhumkar using a gouge in stepidotomy on the attic wall. I'm scared to use it. But when I see Ashim Desai or Ashish using it, they remove it so beautifully. But my same friend Satish Jain never uses it. So it's I think personal preference. I have nothing against diabetes. Oh, thank you. Sir, Deepak Haldipur, sir, you are modest enough. Most likely, you have one of the largest series of uh, stepidotomy, uh, as we all know. Oh, so experience matters. No, oh, but again, like Sanjay Agarwal, I feel. I was the first to do. I have the largest. You know, this is all ego building exercises. What is important is I feel if the patients can get better and they don't beat us up in today's era, that's fair. Enough. Yeah. Okay. Now these questions are for uh, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, sir. What type of stains, if at all, you will advocate to use in a revision revision case, if at all, for Dr. Sanjay Agarwal? Yeah, it should be a silicone stand of good quality. What I am saying, it will give you more trouble than the benefit. So some stands are available locally made, should not be used. Whenever you are using a stand, it should be. I would like to add a point here because Sanjay's Wi-Fi may be a little weak. Yes. There is an Indian stand made by Oro Labs in okay. Madurai by the famous Arbindo Netralaya. It costs about 850 rupees. Yeah. It is an excellent stand comparable to any... Yeah, that has to be good. Yes. Because some stands now available at a rate of 100, 150 rupees. Yes. They are useless. And yeah, because be uh, they get stuck at the canicular level yeah. and only yes. the stick comes out and the stent is correct. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. The next question is, what is your preferred size of carison punch? No, whenever you are doing a surgery, you have to have a full set. You cannot have one punch and get away with it. And as I told, the bigger the punch you are able to use, 
better is the bone removal it is a matter of practice it comes with experience that you are able to use the bigger punch okay i think the doctor yeah yeah doctor do you share your uh, ramen sex experience also when you are removing the bone you have to always open it and see what you do every time yeah yeah i told in the presentation also uh, he has reminded me and correctly very this is a very important step whenever you are using a punch just hold the bone then release it and then remove that bone piece the benefit is if by accident the lacrimal mucosa of the sac is being caught it will not get teared up this is very important i would like to just add a point to sanjay's answer the 90% of your bone removal you do with a large punch yes as you come very closer to the fundus and a little above that when a very small shelf of bone you need to remove you go for a smaller punch yeah and at that time if you can have a curved one also that will help absolutely okay another question what investigations do you prefer for revision case and what is the sensitivity and specificity of the x-ray dactylohistogram over ct scan the what uh, can you repeat the first part what what, what investigation do you prefer for revision case okay. and sensitivity and specificity of mm -hmm. x-ray mm -hmm. dactylohistogram over ct scan now the point is in revision cases you have to assess right from the history everything nasal endoscopic examination everything the basic things why we would try to note why it is failed because sometimes there are known cases of laser dcr being done at some ophthalmic centers so the point is they should give a shot with the laser and that mucus comes and the procedure is over so that small hole is get filled in a week's time so if your history is telling it is a previous laser dcr case you can i tell you can take it as a fresh case so no other investigation is required so basic history and knowing who has done the previous one is very important then about the investigation if it comes mm. cisternogram a person trained radiologist doing a cisternogram should be available if it is there nearby or in the your institute it is very good investigation otherwise ct scan gives a very good panoramic view i think i will add yeah. that in laser dcr you should also take a visual look at the canaliculi sometimes they fire they burn it here. and probing is must before going into any fancy investigation you do the probing because if probing has a hard stop or soft stop everybody knows who are doing regular dcr and if you have a soft stop spot stop and you can see with the endoscope denting there in the nasal cavity then definitely you can have that the bone is not adequately by our previous surgeon with the tenting you can slit it and remove the bone adequately so i mean revision dcr as uh, dr sanjay says clearly if laser dcr you can take it as a fresh dcr but kindly look to the canaliculi because i have seen few yeah, yeah, common canalicular blockage cases we have seen uh, canaliculi and subsequently we cannot give the good result to them because if canaliculi a common canaliculi is short or burned then it becomes very difficult to give it and in laser yes. dcrs it i keep the lacrimal stent for sometimes up to 18 months in failed laser dcrs which are yes. yes about two of the more important reasons of failed dcr one is uh, in the initial surgery e the level of obstruction could not be assessed properly and there is common canalicular block so endoscopic dcr will not be uh, helpful Yes. another thing if the surgeon is basically removing the bone in the lower part without removing the bone covering the fundus then this is another cause of the failure so yes. as dr sanjay agarwal said that prior to the surgery syringing and probing is mandatory and in case of syringing also the interpretation is three one 
water is coming out into the nasopharynx that means there is no obstruction and otherwise there are two types of regurgitation fast regurgitation and slow regurgitation if it is fast regurgitation and the water is coming out as clear as possible with from both the punctum that means the obstruction in the common canalicular region and if it is a slow regurgitation and the regurgitated fluid is turbid one that means it is in the nasolacrimal duct and that will that will be the ideal case for the endoscopic procedure operation so finally i just request each and every speakers to give one final comment starting from dr sp dubey I think uh, I have learned so much today with the lecture of Dr. Deepak Haldipur, and uh, really the cases of stapedial artery. The things which has told very clearly that you can see on the CT scan if is course spinosum is not there because if middle meningeal artery is not there, then the stapedial artery is there. And today morning I was just listening a lecture of uh, on radiology of Dr. Satish Jain. It is in which he confessed that one of the stapedial artery he bipolarized with uh, a bipolar artery, and subsequently the senior told them that you should not bipolarize the stapedial artery because it is going to supply that that part of the brain, which is supplied by the middle meningeal artery. So sometimes you can have a hemiplegia. It's a very important and very relevant point. And as far as CT scan is concerned. now more and more people are doing ct scan in cases of uh, uh, stapedectomy and uh, because more and more information now we are able to read through the hrct temporal bone and with 0.5 mm cuts we can see where the facial nerve is where the sinus tympani what is the cochlear autosclerosis is there or not so i think more and more Uh, previously we were not uh, even uh, now we have abundant doing uh, x ray pns now we are doing ct pns and i think uh, in temporal bone the learning is always improving as an ent surgeon we are learning more and more temporal bone ct teachers like satish jain and our fellow in calcutta so i think uh, day by day because we are not uh, uh, as experience is there with the dr deepak and the history is there that uh, ct is not that much required but i think in the era of evidence based medicine and as he is saying that uh, in the future if court or the guidelines or sops which we are forming or the stapedial surgeon will form a sops then you have to go for the ct scan previous to the stapedial surgery i think it is going to be good in for and as usual uh, dr sanjay agrawal uh, i mean uh, dcr is now more and more uh, i am getting dcr directly because i have done so many numbers of people are coming directly to us and more and more people are aware of because some of the relative got dcr done with ent colleague then he will bring another patient to you you have to be very meticulous and probing and syringing is the best investigation i think and that should be meticulously learned and the results interpretation as it is coming from the same punctum or it is coming from the opposite punctum as well as partially coming from the same pack punctum and syringing with the mitomycin c applying the mitomycin c these are the things which really improves your results as as my earnest request with all the ent colleagues you buy and flexible endoscope not chip on tip only the scope which is costing 3.5 lakhs but flexible endoscope should be a integral part of your armament dr deepak hanipur sir webinars are here to stay there may be too many webinars but in future you will have lot and lot webinars point number 1 they are cost effective point number 2 look at the clarity of the picture and the audibility that i am getting looking at twai pai it's as if he is sitting next to me it is i sanjay agarwal will agree with me because twai pai is much younger to us and he looks much younger than what he is actually but uh, uh, sanjay agarwal and uh, satyaprakash dubey will agree with me the struggles we have gone through to see a simple ear surgery being done through a side tube or a simple video and that to go to germany all the way and today any lecture of mario sana or a satish jain's presentation for singapore or somebody else talking somewhere in brazil we easily get it on the net learning was never never more easier and more practical 
there's no doubt at all it is just that like tv like other mediums we are using the net for wrong reasons and not for the right reasons especially for the audience also if they are interested the lecture is interesting they can watch it others they can unmute you need not collect a group of audience in a hall and then see whether they are sitting there still and the best thing about these webinars is if nobody learns the speakers learn because we need to prepare we need to study we get to know new points this is the same set of slides of stepis but satu and sanjay will tell you that there were more points in this today yes. so this will keep on going on so i think even if 10 people attend 20 people attend we are not doing a political rally what is important is more than the audience we learn sitting at the comfort of our homes a day will come when live surgeries will happen this way dwaipa and dada will be in calcutta and we'll be operating from our respective theaters it's almost like i spent time with all of you for one hour with each one of us sitting next to each other i think the media is here to stay even online consultations are here to stay they may not replace the actual consultation but at times online consultation is the only way thank you so much thank you dr dipak sandipur sir now dr sanjay agarwal sir thank you dwaipan and uh, my friends will agree dwaipan is now the best moderator available in our country and it is really a pleasure that all of us we can yeah, get together and, uh, in this webinar he's got that charisma he's got yeah. that charisma and he's got it that is. boy next door image yeah yeah uh, i can't uh, talk as nicely as satu uh, his photogenic face which satu describes is poetry to him <laughs> <laughs> and thank you center pharma for bringing all of us together and i will agree with dr satyaprakash dubey that this flexible laryngoscope has to be in the arma medium of every ent surgeon and it is a need of the hour this is a basic tool he got me 10 years back because uh, i was not having and he said you have to have it and he just purchased and sent it to me and deepak haldipur as usual is very <laughs> meticulous for this stepis and thank you vaishali and everybody and i okay. see yeah. one last point the flexible scope is the rigid scope is the photographs which are given to the patient become yeah. very important documents medical legally also so i think we must have a flexible scope yes yes and when you document instead of writing with your pen and paper those diagrams which you used to write this far more clear impressive and medical legally evidence based even just basic change in voice assessment is very good with the flexible yes. rather than you are holding the tongue and examining with the 70 or 90 yes because you see the natural movements of the cord yes think jay kumar has started one year fellowship for flexible endoscopy and he is doing for flexible esophagoscopy or gastroscopy and he was telling me there are certain entity we are also writing right and left treatment for lpr and gerd and he was telling me there are only 20 medical diseases when the rigid scope question of rigid scope is there foreign body you are removing with esophagoscope but the problems of esophagoscope you are not addressing he was telling me there are uh, i mean he is preparing a atlas also and he has got one year fellowship i think more and more people will go for the real triple endoscopy by ent surgeons only laryngoscopy bronchoscopy as well as esophagoscopy i think uh, it is going to be uh, uh, more practicing enhancing the uh, people who are not doing surgery now in a covid era they can do at least with protection flexible scopy and a good amount of money okay now thank better you very much, yeah. thank you dwaipayan as always you inspire me and satu and sanjay the final comment of uh, dwaipayan Yeah, now I will request Dr. Vaishali uh, to give vote of thanks from uh, Centur, and uh, we all are very much thankful mm -hmm. to uh, Centur Pharma uh, for organizing this uh, event, and we will look forward for such meeting in near future also. Dr. Vaishali. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would like to extend a deep, a great honor to uh, express my gratitude 
to each and everyone who are involved to make this webinar a resounding success. Firstly, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to Center Pharmaceutical for giving this wonderful platform. I would like to also express my gratitude to our eminent speakers for today who had got excellent video slides presentation and making it not too monotonous and interesting for all of the viewers and us. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Deepak sir, Dr. Sanjay sir, and Dr. Dubey sir for the wonderful session, making it more uh, insightful and meaningful. I would also like to uh, extend my profound gratitude to Deepa uh, and Mukherjee sir. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, in this webinar, we have learned many things. And I think most of the questions which were there from audiences, uh, we were able to get the answers from our speaker. Thank you so much. Thanks each and everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.